So hi, I'm Nazar Abdenour, Assistant Professor of Genomics and Computational Biology at UMass Medical School. Glad to be back home in Canada and presenting at BOSC for the first time. Um, so I have a research lab that's passionate about foundational software infrastructure for improving genomic data science. And I'm going to talk to you today about a concept I call composable bioinformatics. So I'm going to motivate this talk with a career information page on a website designed to encourage high school students to seek biomedical careers. Here they describe what they call a bioinformatics scientist, a career that they emphasize requires a PhD, and they go on to spotlight a day in the life of a bioinformatics scientist. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that at least half of this day is typical day is devoted to the captivating task of converting data from one file format to another. It's a bad joke. Sadly, we all know this is kind of true. And so my talk is inspired by a concept called composability. It's recently been popularized by a, a company called Voltron, which focuses on the data systems used in large enterprises. And one of the key points they make in their white paper is that standardization really matters most, not in the core doer components of data systems, the UIs, the execution engines, and storage technologies, but in the gluer pieces between those components, so intermediate representations and connectivity protocols. The emergence of open standards in these areas can enable us to design more sophisticated systems, and that's because you can now reuse the available doer components and substitute them as needed with minimal pain. So could such a philosophy work in bioinformatics and in genomics? I'm going to try to argue a bit for composable bioinformatics with uh, three very short vignettes because I have limited time. And so to get quickly started, let's talk about file formats. So bioinformatics has a long legacy of many specialized file formats, often text-based, and many of these have experienced lots of innovation over time, including specialized binary layouts, compression and indexing technologies, and even very good standardization. But in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that we typically embrace the Unix philosophy in bioinformatics, why is it that our workflows often always feel like Rube Goldberg machines? <laughs> and I think that's because bioinformatic tools tend to be tightly coupled to format I.O. And they tend to rely on low-level reference libraries for, implementate, for manipulation. And as a result, bioinformatics workflows really shuffle data through these meandering and time-consuming transformations in order to accommodate each tool's idiosyncratic requirements. And similarly, genomics visualization tools need to handle a ton of various complex file types or really require that users do a lot of, of format conversion as well. So what ends up happening is, you know, researchers are pretty isolated from directly accessing the problem-specific problem information in these files, and developers can't easily integrate bioinformatic formats into modern data science tooling. And in general, there's just this high kinetic barrier to researchers being able to develop interactive tools really tailored to answer their, their specific research questions. And one general, one observation is that in this zoo of formats, it can really be boiled down fundamentally to two modalities. There's table-ish data, say your classic tab delimited formats and their binary counterparts, your SAMs and BAMs. And then there's array-ish data like high C contact maps, cell by gene matrices and so on. And we can always debate which format or container formats these data should be stored in persistently and propose you know, modern solutions but with the enormous amount of legacy data and the constant evolution of storage technologies, I don't think this is really the, the right problem to focus on first. I think what's really more important is the representation of the materialized queries to these data stores in memory, the, the data structures. And so for tabular data, that representation is the data frame. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this talk. There is an open standard here. It's called Apache Arrow. Arrow is a columnar in-memory layout for tabular data organized for efficient analytics on CPU and GPU, and it supports zero copy access and efficient interprocess communication. It has been adopted in the broader data science community, great, greatly eliminating a lot of the copy and convert steps when moving data between popular analytics libraries and enterprise storage backends. So my lab, uh, our goal was to see if we could, it would be possible to bring this standard into genomics. And so we developed a library called Oxbow that can efficiently shuttle data from legacy NGS files, like things like indexed and binary files like the HTS lib ones to, um, to Arrow using uh, low-level libraries written in Rust rather than in C. So Rust, as you may know, is a modern systems programming language that provides memory safety, performance, and much easier binding to high-level languages like Python and R. And so namely, we took advantage of the Noodles library by Michael Macias at, out of St. Jude for the HTS lib formats. And with Jack Huey at UMass, we also released a, U, a Rust library to read and write the UCSC BigWig and BigBed file formats. And so with Oxbow, traditional NGS files can be efficiently queried and materialized simply as data frames. So genomic data can really just be data. Um, it can also, for example, be a distributed data frame. So we can start leveraging cool libraries in the 
in the Python ecosystem like Dask, for example, that can take a, a big file and partition it into a virtual data frame made up of little pieces that can be loaded independently. And we can perform virtually you know, standard data frame operations on these objects that don't get um, executed eagerly, but get encoded as a task graph. And then those can be deployed out of core on various infrastructure. And so, although I have limited time, I'm just gonna go quickly and play this just to show you an example of a Dask, sorry. Uh, no. uh, what happened? Is it in the PowerPoint? Yeah, it's playing a movie. It's in the PowerPoint. Ah. Uh, does it have sound? Yeah. No. Okay. I think it's gone. This is just a Dask cluster on a, in a Jupyter notebook. You can see a dashboard on the right. Um, it, has, it shows you sort of the status. This is just a big machine with like 64 no, uh, cores. Um, I'm loading up a, a BAM file it's over a gig. And I'm loading into a Dask data frame, which doesn't materialize everything. It just sort of shows you that it knows what the schema is, and it's broken it up into 30, 320 something partitions. And so we can start just, you know, we can materialize the first few rows, but we can also just think about doing operations that don't require specialized tooling anymore. Like, say, I want to know the average mapping quality. That's just asking for the mean of a column. And in this case, we call sort of a panda style mean. And then I add the compute method at the end, which will eagerly send this off to be executed. And you can see the task running on a task graph and a task stream. So it's very efficiently computing the average mapping quality. And you can imagine doing other things like if I want to dedupe or count duplicates, I don't need something special like the card tools. That's another data frame operation. And you can see now that you, just by providing this interoperability with these open standards, you can start to leverage some pretty cool functionality. Um, and so now I'm going to quickly, very quickly talk about genomic range operations. Um, I don't think I need to tell this audience how important genomic intervals are in, in data analysis in our field. We are privileged in, in genomics to have these reference coordinate systems to which countless amounts of data and annotations have been mapped. Um, genomic intervals are semantically important because interval arithmetic and spatial joins like intersection and nearest neighbors provide a language for expressing questions we want to answer about genomic features, like which enhancers are close to these genes. And so the go-to solution for this is, of course, BedTools, a command line program that operates on text files in the Bed format, a format which was only standardized officially two years ago. Michael Hoffman, if you're in the, the, the crowd, thank you. Um, in our case, we wanted to see if people, if we could decouple some of these operations from cumbersome file formats, though, and if we could specifically leverage the Python ecosystem to do this. So together with the Open2C community, which Vidat and my lab presented yesterday, we developed a Python library called BioFrame to address this. And in BioFrame, we focus on Pandas, the most popular data frame library in Python. We took a slightly different approach from the bioconductor community in R. So in BioFrame, genomic ranges are represented as plain old Pandas data frames. No specialized data structures or subclasses, no wrapper objects, no serialization, deserialization. BioFrame is just a Pandas data frame with um, columns called by default Chrome start and end. Otherwise, there are no restrictions on the fields or data types a BioFrame can have. Furthermore, we decided to implement our spatial joins using simple NumPy and Pandas primitives instead of creating and maintaining custom interval tree data structures in a low-level language and turned out to have basically the same performance. Uh, we have an extensive API of interval operations and spatial joins. We have you know, a guide for BedTools users to, to translate some of their command line invocations into BioFrame. Um, I don't have time to go through the demo shown here, but I just want to basically say that with BioFrame, you can easily interactively explore and analyze genomic feature data frames. Here, there's like basically a data frame of chip seek peaks and another one of motif predictions. And we can start doing these like joins with no round tripping to text or weird objects. Um, and many operations can just be done using pandas native code, like assigning the, the maximum scoring motif to a chip seek peak. The other point I want to make here is that BioFrame not only makes interactive computing uh, more easier, but since Python is truly a general purpose programming language, it starts to provide a bridge to start incorporating genomic range operations into a full-fledged application programming. Which brings me to my next last vignette, which is interactivity and visualization. And I'm going to talk specifically about computational notebooks and Jupyter in particular, the de facto standard environment for notebook computing. Jupyter has seen so much success and popularity because it really bridges two worlds. On the one side, you have a computational kernel, usually Python, but also others like R or Julia. And then on the other side, you have the front end web platform, which is a gateway not just to advanced graphics, but various other forms of user interactivity. Um, 
And so Jupyter widgets are really a special part of this architecture because they specifically allow you to communicate bidirectionally between the kernel and the front end and synchronize state between the two environments. So it really allows you to leverage the best of both platforms. The Jupyter widgets ecosystem lets you create lots of awesome things. There is like the basic form elements provided by the IPy widgets library, like buttons and sliders, but there's also a lot of domain specific visualizations and tools that even you can make, how, like you see here, but Turns out authoring your own custom widgets is really hard. And why? You may have known this, noticed this. Well, on the front end, Jupyter is really not just one platform, but many platforms have adopted the core Jupyter architecture, including the classic notebook, Jupyter Lab, VS Code, Google Colab, Jupyter Lite. And there are also many dashboarding frameworks that now provide support for Jupyter widgets. Authoring a traditional widget involves writing a Python module and some complementary JavaScript code, but not just one piece of JavaScript code. It turns out each Jupyter-like platform has its own unique requirements to find and import JavaScript modules on the web server side. And that's because for a long time, there was no standard way to import JS code in a modular fashion, leading to a proliferation of third-party and ad hoc module systems. What that means for you as a widget author is that you are responsible for creating front-end code targeting each specific platform represented by these puzzle pieces. What that also means is that you as a widget author need to incorporate a full web build tool chain and install your widget as a full-fledged Jupyter extension during development. For distribution, you also need to know how to bundle and publish uh, your kernel and front-end widget components to both Python, PyPI, and NPM registries separately and keep them synchronized. Like, no, no, why? <laughs> Please don't, right? What this means for Jupyter widgets as an ecosystem and for users is that a lot of the time these puzzle pieces are missing or misshapen and things just don't work as you expect. As a widget author, you deal with the burden of ensuring platform compatibility instead of building and maintaining the things that you care about. And so Trevor Mance, a super talented PhD researcher that I co-mentor, was dealing exactly with this issue, contributing to a number of widget-based visualization tools, and he came up with a solution called AnyWidget. Now, any widget is both a standard and a set of authoring tools for making widgets that run universally uh, easy and accessible to author. And with any widget, you still author the front end component of your widget in JavaScript. Um, but not just any JavaScript. Uh, it's a standard for JavaScript modules called ECMAScript modules. And it's a standard that has been adopted by all web browsers today, but not necessarily when many of these Jupyter like front ends were first created. And so by adopting a standard module system, any widget is also able to define a consistent dependency-free interface called the AnyWidget front-end module, which presents a set of lifecycle hooks that authors can use to define the front-end part of their widgets and communicate with the kernel and the output cell. Uh, importantly, these methods like the render function you see here uh, receive dependencies that are injected at runtime from the Jupyter platform. Importantly, they are, not built, they are no longer build time dependencies for developers, and this relieves a huge burden for widget authors. And so given a widget's kernel and front-end module, any widget provides an adapter that bypasses uh, the, the platform-specific import systems and loads the front-end modules from the kernel, just like Python code. This means that a widget can be provided as a single Python and JS source, but it also means that you can now author um, a, a widget directly inside a notebook, which wasn't possible before. You can also evolve your widget into a mature package and distribute it as a single unified Python package. And you can choose to even adopt front-end build tooling in order to leverage advanced frameworks like React or Svelte or other functionality. But the end target is always web standard and dependency-free ECMAScript. Um, in this way, any widget supports the full development cycle of widget authorship from prototyping to mature package. And furthermore, uh, new platforms can and are adopting the AnyWidget front-end module of ES standard to support a, a widget plugin system, which is allowing any widgets to work in places where even classic Jupyter widgets did not. And so I don't have time to give you a proper demo of what any widget can do, but we were at the SciPy conference in Tacoma last week, and we gave a tutorial, and Trevor gave a great talk about any widget, and these have been recorded, so I highly recommend you check them out when they're posted on YouTube soon. Um, but I will quickly just say, this is playing. Yeah, um, you can just copy and paste this example from the docs. You see it's all inline code. You can create a button here. You can click on it, but the state is also accessible through Python and you can modify it. You can actually uh, export your inline code directly to source files as, as things evolve and some of the, and everything just works. And the cool thing about ECMAScript modules is you can take advantage of something called hot module replacement, where you can start mod modifying the, the front end files and you'll see immediate updates in your notebook without re rerunning a cell or restarting your kernel or re reloading your page. Another benefit of ECMAScript modules is that you can start importing cool new libraries you wanna try directly from a URL, like this confetti cannon here. 
and just try it out. And we can start firing confetti. And because any widgets are Jupyter widgets, they play, they play well with iPy widgets. So you can hook this up to a slider button and start firing confetti all around. And so you start to see the kinds of cool things you can do. Um, it's actually been very successful. This uh, sort of embracing standards has really made it possible to, to have a renaissance in the widget ecosystem. So since this was released last year, we've seen a huge jump in the number of widgets created um, in dark blue. And even ones that were created before in, in light blue have been backported to use any widget. Uh, if you go to the documentation page, we also have um, a cool gallery you can check out to see some of the cool things people are making in the community. There's also a Discord. Check it out. Um, and so now putting it all together, I want to try to give you a quick peek of what a composable bioinformatics ecosystem can enable. Um, this is a little notebook app we built for our 40, and 40 nucleome research in my lab. You can see three scatter plots here created using Jupyter Scatter, which is an any widget um, component created by Fritz Lechess. And on top, you can actually see a genome browser um, uh, called HighGlass that has high C maps. These are three different cell types during a differentiation. Um, and uh, these are three embeddings derived from high C. Each point represents a 50 kilobase locus. And those are the high C maps that they come from. And we have a track in the browser that reflects the points being selected. So when I select points in, in one scatter plot, they're linked with all the others. And you actually see the selection of the genomic loci in the original context in the genome browser. So you can really start to dig down into these abstract embeddings and start to understand what they mean. And so all of this was hooked up together in the notebook, which is important. And we actually communicate all the genomic range information using BioFrame. So this is what I mean, where you can start to compose these things and start to build bespoke applications to answer questions that you have. And so that's the power of composable bioinformatics. And if you were here for, the, for BioViz, there was a great talk by Fritz, and hopefully you can watch it after it's, it's put up, it was recorded, where he talks about composable visualization. And he also created um, a really cool uh, comparative embedding visualization for, for cytometric data. And he hooked it up in a notebook to another widget that has an LLM, and he's able to use the LLM to ask questions and, and make the, the visualization actually respond and search for the things he asks for. And again, this was all sort of built inside a notebook. Um, and so to conclude, I'd just like to highlight one of the lessons we've picked up from working on these different tools. We find, I find that one of the biggest and most frustrating sources of friction in our work comes from highly coupled concerns that ought to be separated. And um, you know, we have sort of file I.O. from algorithms, data storage from memory layout. And what I just showed you was really you know, platform build dependencies from plugin authorship. Like diff the difference between an extension and a plugin. If you really want an ecosystem to thrive, you have to split those things up. And it's really these cross-disciplinary open standards, not like domain specific. There's kind of the magic, the magic uh, pixie dust that can help you do that. Um, and so, uh, and really, really enable sort of com a composable ecosystem. And so with that, I'd like to thank my lab and collaborators, especially Trevor Mance for his work on Oxbow and Any Widget and his Any Widget slides, which are great. Uh, Jack Huey for his help with big tools and, uh, and Oxbow, Vidat, as well as the Open2C community and our Google Summer of Code contributors uh, for help with BioFrame. And I hope to see many of you at CoFest. If you're going to be here, we'll be working on, you know, if there's Python or Rust projects you want to work on or you want to learn how to make your own widget, just enough JavaScript to get going. Talk to me. Thank you. We have time for one question. Maybe two. <laughs> Please come back and then. Uh, amazing work. I really enjoyed the slides. Uh, I was wondering, you know, Jupyter Elements are great for the uh, exploratory analysis and generating features. Yeah. Has your lab um, kind of centered around a uh, way of using notebooks for generating results, like in a reliable or standardized way so that? Yeah. It's part of a workflow as opposed to just the exploratory portion of the analysis. Um, not a ton. We do try to like. I find the workflow is you do a lot of exploratory analysis. Eventually, you start refactoring and you end up with a library. And that I, I find that sort of the workflow. The other app, the other way to go is you start creating a, a, an application. So you turn it into you know the classic is to turn it into a dashboard. And one of our goals with, with any widget is just making that transition much easier so you're not refactoring the code to do it. And this is actually happening in the ecosystem. Like you can, right now in Jupyter, there's this thing called voila, which is a very quick way to turn a notebook into just a dashboard. It removes all the code cells and it, you can actually like host a simple dashboard. Uh, but as I was saying, now that um, Jupyter widgets are sort of acceptable and there are other plat non-Jupyter platforms that accept the any widget standard, 
you can easily start transitioning this code into more like mature applications. And so kind of that sort of life cycle from just like prototyping to, to production, there's like exploratory to more like well-defined mature sort of application as well.